Turn it up, swashbucklers. You're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 169. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm the ship's plumber and your host for the show today. So thank you for tuning in. I always appreciate it uh, when you listen and you visit the sponsors and you tell your friends and you send donations and all that kind of good stuff that helps me keep the old boat afloat. I appreciate it. You know the old websites, underthecrossbones.com on Facebook, facebook.com slash underthecrossbones, twitter.com slash undercrossbones would know the show notes at underthecrossbones.com for this episode, underthecrossbones.com slash 169. And do be sure that you are subscribed in your favorite podcast app, whatever that may be, because we're on all of them. All of them now, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Slacker, uh, Podcast Addict, Overcast, whatever you want to, just click the subscribe button. And you'll get those new episodes every Tuesday when they come out. Uh, episode 169, fun fact about the number 169, uh, in the game of Texas Hold'em Poker, there are 169 non-equivalent starting hands, which I don't exactly know what that means. <laughs> But I think what that means is that there's 169 different starting hands. Uh, when you go on to Wikipedia and they use a phrase like uh, non-equivalent starting hands, I go Google that uh, to find out what that actually means in terms of what poker is, uh, and nothing came up. So I have to assume it's just some Yahoo using big words on Wikipedia because they know what they are. Uh, and I know what non-equivalent means. I just don't know what it means in the context of poker. So I assume it means there's 169 different starting hands in the game of Texas Hold'em. Uh, so, you know, how hard could the game be? It's hard, by the way. I've I've lost at Texas Hold'em uh, many, many a time. Uh, I, I play poker once a year or so, and uh, I lose uh, once a year. That's how it works. So we have a great guest on the show today, Jasper Rauhorst of Craft Game Studio. Uh, they are a video game uh, production company, a video game studio out of the Netherlands. So we're going all the way across the world. Uh, we got, in fact, there's a bunch of international episodes coming up, just so you know. But uh, we're going all the way to the Netherlands today uh, to visit with Jasper uh, about his game called Crooked Waters. And this is a not just a pirate video game, but a VR, a virtual reality pirate video game. Uh, as far as I know, the first one. Uh, I don't. I, I haven't run across anybody else doing VR stuff with pirates yet. So this is uh, very cool, and we're going to talk about the, uh, the 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 design challenges of VR. Uh, which includes everything from making sure people don't walk out of frame uh, to uh, making sure they don't get motion sick, uh, that kind of stuff. And we're going to talk about how he got into uh, video game design and how they work with such a small company. And so it's, it's a good, fun talk. Uh, there's a little bit of, of audio stuff because we're talking from halfway across the world and somehow that is still uh, an issue even when we're everything is digital, but that's a thing. Uh, so anyway, it's a great talk. You're going to have uh, fun with that one. If you are down in the southeast of the United States right now, uh, you have plenty of time to listen to podcasts because you're staying indoors uh, with your little freak snowstorm happening down there. So I hope you're all staying safe with that happening. What they call it, Diego? Diego doesn't sound like a snowstorm. Diego sounds like a tropical storm. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, I don't know any Diegos that are like all uh, snowy and cold people. Not at all. Uh, I know some Diegos who are tropical. So it's the wrong name for your storm. Uh, it should be uh, uh, tro uh, sn uh, Snowstorm Gunther. Gunther sounds more like a, like a snowstorm name, I think. So I think they went wrong on that one, but I hope you're staying safe. Uh, stay in your house. Uh, listen to podcasts. It'll be all good. So uh, I, this, uh, I had... A rare Saturday night off this past weekend. I did gigs on Friday and on Sunday, what I'll tell you about in a second. But I had a rare Saturday night. Rare in general, super rare in December, outside of holidays or whatever. Uh, because Saturdays, uh, I mean, December is like corporate gigs, charity gigs, that kind of stuff uh, come up a lot, which is what I was doing the rest of the weekend. But I, Saturday night was open and it was it was uh, it was wonderful. I spent the whole day with my girlfriend. Uh, we decided to make a cheese fondue for dinner. Uh, now, that seems like a weird 1977 kind of thing to choose to do for dinner, uh, but it was because when we were in Portland uh, the weekend be before, we had dinner at a uh, Swiss restaurant, and they had a cheese fondue appetizer on the menu, and it was $24 uh, for basically a bowl of melted cheese and some bread. And I was like, I don't want to pay 24 bucks <laughs> for fondue with just this. Because we've had better fondue at other places that come with more stuff for not that much more money. So uh, I said, look, when we get home, we will we'll make fondue. 
and she held me to it because we have a fondue set that sits up in our in our you know the back of a closet somewhere everybody's got a fondue set in the back of a closet somewhere uh, and it just happened that we knew where ours was and so we made we made the fondue we had some gruyere uh i think we used some uh uh gouda uh and some some very sharp cheddar a little bit of white wine. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you may probably know if you've listened to the show before, I'm not a drinker, right? Uh, I do have bottles of wine in the house that have been gifted to me over the years, and they sit in the back of the cabinet with the fondue set. And uh, so, but I didn't want to bust open. I needed like a cup of wine for this fondue. So I didn't want to buy, I didn't want to crack open a whole bottle of wine, basically waste a bottle of wine uh, just for a cup of white wine for this fondue. So we went looking for a small container of white wine, which I found, I found little containers of like cooking wine before, but we went to grocery outlet. Uh, and that's the key word there is outlet. Uh, they have things that uh, haven't sold other places. And what I found there was uh, the probably the least classy wine I've ever seen. Uh, it was called Uppercut Wine, and it came in a can. Uh, and it was a mixed white wine. This was like, you have like seriously... I don't know anything about wine, but this, I, I guarantee it was terrible wine. In fact, we both took a sip of it and went, <laughs> it was terrible. Uh, and I, that could be we just don't like white wine or this was terrible wine. But a wine, wine should not come in a container that you can smash against your forehead at a frat party is what I'm saying. Uh, and it came in a can and it was called Uppercut. And it had a picture on the front, a comic book picture of a woman dealing an uppercut to a dude. Uh, it was the most violent container of wine I've seen. Uh, and uh, we bought it. It was $2 and we put it in the fondue because we just needed something acidic to make the cheese do what it's supposed to do. Uh, so we got that and the and it was good. It turned out good. We had never made a cheese fondue before, uh, but I read, the, read some instructions on the old internet because that's where all the instructions are now. And, uh, and we, had, it was good. And so we had some cheese fondue. We cut up some vegetables, some apple, some bread. Uh, we had some steaks with it. And that was my Saturday night. It was so freaking relaxing, man. Uh, it's, it just doesn't happen that I get a Saturday night off with my girl like that, where we can just cook something. So that was nice. So the rest of the weekend, like I said, uh, uh, corporate charity gigs, that kind of thing. So Friday night I was playing a corporate gig for a group that owns a movie theater, or a chain of movie theaters uh, up in like Santa Rosa, Healdsburg, northern northern North Bay area up there. Uh, and the, so I was playing in a movie theater, which fortunately they had a little stage and they had some lights. But corporate gigs are always interesting because when you do a joke, uh, everybody kind of glances at the boss to see if they're allowed to laugh at it. Uh, and so we have to work really clean. And I did work really clean because the guy that booked me said, hey, look, go to town. We all know what's up. It's a comedy show. You can do your R-rated show. And I did a couple. I have some tester jokes at the beginning of my set uh, that I can use to see, sort of suss out the audience and see where we can go. So I did my couple of tester jokes. And immediately I was like, we are not doing the rated R show tonight. That will not go well. Uh, so it was fun. Uh, corporate audiences are always a little, little mellow. Uh, and uh, there was one drunk dude who was trying to helpfully heckle. Helpfully heckling is when they they think they're adding to the show and they're just not. And I just I just kept shutting him down with like stock heckler lines and things like that. But uh, he, he was like, I have a song called I Want to Rock. And he just kept going, yeah, I want to rock. He was just very agreeable. And uh, yeah, so it was interesting. Uh, but they sent me home with a, a box of uh, macarons and tiny cupcakes uh, that were fantastic from apparently from a place called Mustache in Healdsburg, that I don't know anything about, but if you're in Healdsburg and you want some good tiny, tiny ass little cupcakes and some macarons, go to Mustache. Uh, I'll find it next time I'm up there too. So then last Sunday, Sunday, I was, uh, uh, see, uh, a lot of these gigs are places where you would not normally find comedy. And last night, Sunday, was a, uh, a prime example of that uh, as I was playing at a P.F. Chang's uh, in the middle of a mall in Walnut Creek, California. Uh, and not a place conducive to comedy at all but they kind of roped us off into this little area it was we were raising money for toys for tots uh and it was me and larry bubbles brown and gene yee and uh patrick mcdermott and uh and uh and uh somebody else was there uh <laughs> well bob johnson uh, was there and so it was uh, a fun show we raised money we got toys there was a raffle to raise a good chunk of money there was a nice little audience there uh and that was fun but the what you get at the charity gigs is you get people who don't 
often go to comedy shows or sometimes have never been to a stand-up show. Uh, and and they just kind of look at you like, oh, we're not quite sure what's happening. And when somebody like, if you have not seen Larry Bubbles Brown, uh, go look him up on the internet. He's He's been on, uh, he was on the Letterman show twice. Uh, great guy. Uh, very disturbing on stage. And I was just watching people look at him like, oh my gosh, somebody get this man help uh, rather than <laughs> laughing at some of his jokes. So you get those kind of audiences and it's always an adventure uh, to, to make it work. But I, I closed out the show. I headlined and uh, they did good. I kept it clean, kept it punchy, worked it in. I did some Chinese food jokes because uh, we were in a PF Chang's and I, I didn't see, I said, I don't, I, uh, I don't think this is very authentic. I have not seen any chicken heads uh, nor a fish that come looking uh, like a fish when they arrive at the table. Um, if you've ever been to a real Chinese restaurant, you know what I'm talking about. That's how it works. But so anyway, that was the weekend there. Now I'm, I'm back on the road this week and I've uh, got a big tour north, uh, west USA happening in Oregon, Washington. And of course, my car, uh, the maintenance light went on yesterday. Uh, the battery, my key fob died yesterday. So like I got to run around today and get all that garbage fixed before I can take it on the road. But here's what's coming up uh, on Wednesday, the 12th. That's this Wednesday. I'll be at the Mill Casino in North Bend, Oregon, uh, two shows that night. On Thursday the 13th, I'll be at the Mount Shasta Vets Club in Mount Shasta, California. December uh, 14, 15, that's Friday and Saturday, I'll be at Chadwick's in Medford, Oregon. On the 16th, I'll be at the Slide Inn in Portland. On the 18th, Collector's Choice, Nahomish, Washington. It's hard to say. On the 19th, I'll be at Seven Cedars Casino in Squim, Washington, which isn't pronounced, it's pronounced Squim, but it's spelled Sequim. I don't know why they do that. On the 21st, I'll be at Seven Nightclub in Bend, Oregon. And on the 28th, I'll be back in the Bay Area at the Vikings Clubhouse in Hayward, California. Uh, to get all the details for those shows and other shows coming up, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Florida, all that's on the calendar, go to underthecrossbones.com, click on the tour dates button, and you can see all that stuff there. And uh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to dress warm. It's not snowing yet. I checked the weather. Uh, but I'm packing some chains. Because I am going over the Sierras uh, and up through the Oregon coast and all that kind of stuff, and uh, that can get that can get dicey this time of year. So I'm packing the chains, but so far there's not uh, not a ton of snow up there. Why? Because it's all apparently in South Carolina for some strange reason. Um, so uh, I I can pack my Parada clothing. I can pack my, my summery Parada clothing because it's not going to be that cold. Yeah, uh, we are sponsored, of course, today by Parada clothing. And their brand new website is a pirate utopia of shirts and hats and clothing and swimwear. And it's all steeped in the lore of pirates and treasure. And if you're going to the Caribbean on a cruise, right, you see snow bunnies getting on a ship and going to the Caribbean. Or maybe you're going to head down to the Keys, get down below the snow line. And uh, this is the gear you want to take with you. They got all sorts of cool summery tropical pirate gear uh, that you can wear for your summery tropical things. Or you know what? Just crank up the heat in your house. Put on your Parada uh, swimsuit. Do it. Nobody knows. Uh, open the windows. And they'll just be like, uh, it's summer in here. Yeah. Uh, what is that? Uh, there's a Grace Grace Potter song uh, called Hot Summer Nights. But it's cold outside, but it's a hot summer night in here. That's what Parada Clothing can do for you in the middle of the winter. Go check out ParadaClothing.com. Be sure to click the ship wheel on the website to get in on Blackbeard's treasure hunt. And again, that is ParadaClothing.com. If you need a custom order for your crew, they can help you with that. Call them up. one 607 loot That is one 607 loot And they will hook you up. ParadaClothing.com. All right. If you're enjoying the show, I hope you are. Head over to the support page, underthecrossbones.com slash support. Check out uh, right there. You can uh, put in a donation. You can click the Amazon banner, finish up your Christmas shopping. Amazon kicks me back a few shekels. There's sponsorship information, all that good stuff. All right. Okay, let's get into my interview here with Jasper Rauhorst uh, from uh, Craft Game Studio about his game, Crooked Waters, which, again, is a pirate VR game. Uh, so if you're into the VR stuff, maybe you're going to get your, maybe uh, somebody gets you an Oculus Rift for uh, Christmas. You can pop that in there. You can get yourself some some pirate action with Crooked Waters. So let's head over to the Netherlands right now. Let's talk to Jasper Rauhorst. Check it out. The name of your company is Craft Game Studio. And uh, the reason we're talking today is you have a pirate game called Crooked Waters, which looks like a whole bunch of fun. And what I find uh, interesting about it, I'm not much of a gamer myself, but I am uh, intrigued by virtual reality as an art form in all its different forms. So uh, you guys are working in VR, which I think is really cool. Can you tell us a little bit about the game to start? 
Yeah, so uh, Crooked Wallace is a uh, virtual reality pirate game. It's a multiplayer game where you and your friends or others team up and fight uh, against another team of players. So uh, basically, uh, at the start of each match, uh, both teams get their own 17th century pirate ship. Like All right. Get, get their own. And they compete against each other. And uh, at the moment, it's uh, it's a death match. So the one who sinks the other first uh, wins. Um, but we are working on a, a large update, uh, which will contain new new types of gameplay and uh, a new game mode. So yeah, basically it's a, a pirate game and a, it's a four players up to four players per team. Okay. Um, and while in the game, you have to manage your ship. Uh, you know, like the, the real thing, I suppose, you have to do on the pirate ship, like uh, maintaining the sails. Uh, of course, have a helmsman to navigate the ship. Um, load the cannons, preparations, uh, things like that. Yeah. Uh, stay on the lookout. Okay, neat. And so is it primarily ship-to-ship combat, or is there hand-to-hand combat as well yet? There is hand-to-hand uh, hand-to-hand combat at the moment. Cool. It's not a main feature yet. We did it, we implemented a first iteration of it uh, because we noticed some gameplay in the game that that required to prevent players from boarding your ship <laughs> like what we saw what we saw often happen is that players jumped on your ship they fired all your cannons and you had to reload all your cannons again and so uh, yeah we we wanted a, a way to prevent um Prevent other players from boarding your ship. It's not the final version. Okay. At all. Yet. That's funny. That's so people were going on to some somebody else's ship, firing all the cannons so that they couldn't fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was the first time we saw it. Yeah. That's hilarious. I, I suppose they're always going to find a way to use the game in some way that you were not planning on, right? Yeah, but that's the fun thing about uh, about it. So we don't don't want to prevent it. It's like we want the, the defenders or the ones that are on the ship a uh, way to defend in, in some way. So we added swords and, uh, and, and musket pistols. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely fun to, uh, to see other people play your game in, in a way you didn't really expect. Yeah, that's funny. So uh, I think everybody should know that you guys are a very, very small company. There's only three of you, right? Is that correct? Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. we just graduated, uh, so it's yeah, we are a really young company and a really well. We are ex- trying to get a lot of experience, uh-huh. but uh, well, to be honest, we're not that experienced yet in the business side of way. So we are all software engineering uh, graduates since this year. Okay, so we know how to program and we know we know how to code, but the, the business side is really new and it's really small. So. We have to do everything, uh, the sounds, the visual effects, the, the programming, the gameplay, the, and things like that, the business, the marketing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose you always have to learn the art before you learn the commerce part of it, or at least that's been my uh, my experience with those types of things. So you got your computer engineering degree, and you come out of that, and now you're faced with, now we need music and graphics and all this other stuff yeah. that you probably didn't study as much about. How are you dealing with that learning curve? Um, I think a benefit of being a software engineer is that that's part of the, the business. That's part of the the, yeah, the job, uh-huh. part of the skill. Uh, everything in software engineering, like what you learn on, on school, is just they they point you in a direction, but the rest you have to figure it out all by yourself. And so we are not unfamiliar with learning in a way that that, that there are a lot of things we didn't know before. Um, that you have to learn, like software engineering goes in so many, many ways. There's so much to learn in software alone. Um, so we're quite familiar with new things and learning and really dig into it and, and make it yourself. And yeah, so it's hard, but it's not uncommon for us. <laughs> it's, it's just a matter yeah. of, yeah, okay, let's figure it out, whatever it is. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. It's not, we, we, we don't get scared by things we don't know. It's part of the business. Sure. Now, this is an amazing amount of work for just three people to take on, Uh, especially when you look at the credits for the average video game. There's a list as long as, you know, a movie credit uh, list. 
And <laughs> so how do you how do you manage with just the three of you to create an entire game without losing the rest of your lives? <laughs> um, well, the main part is that we all have passion in gaming and game development. Uh-huh. Um, so personally, I don't really see it as work. Uh, it, I, it does influence my personal life, I think, in a way that, you know, sometimes you have to, the, the option to develop your game or to maybe hang out well, hang out with friends or, you know, uh, go to a movie or something. Um, and they are, for me, both equally fun. So, yeah, it's, it's, I put a lot, we put a lot of hours in, uh, in the development of the game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just a workaholic. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's not that my, my personal life is really influenced by it, but yeah, that, mm, yeah a lot of our work we put in. in I, yeah, I can, I completely understand that. My, my girlfriend is always like, Hey, let's go on vacation. I'm like, uh, I got work to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I have things to be done. <laughs> so I get that. Uh, and so did, did the three of you all go to school together? Yeah. We met in, uh, in school as well. Oh, okay. So, you were you probably I imagine there were tons of uh, of uh, test projects and all things like that that you did together. So you've got some experience working together before you entered in this project. And actually, this isn't even your first game. You had the you have another game called Indigenous, right? Yeah. Well, Indigenous, uh, it's, it was our first project. Uh, we didn't really uh, complete it, or we didn't really try to release it. It was our first project in in game development. Uh-huh. So it. it we see it as a prototype. Okay. It's not, we did, we didn't release it on Steam. We, uh, put a free de- demo online on, uh, on Pitch. So, uh, it's, it's free for everyone to download and to try it out. But it was our first experience with game development in general because our, our study was more focused about, yeah, software engineering. Okay. And not game development. I see. Okay. All right. So, so uh, I imagine you probably grew up as a gamer and have a long history of playing games that you would want to get into the game design in the first place, yeah? Um, well, I don't... I've played a, quite a few games, uh-huh. quite a lot of games, but I don't really consider myself as a real gamer, especially in my younger years. Okay. Um, I'm Currently, I'm sitting more behind my computer than I did when I was younger. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I've played quite a few games, but I didn't really... 24 seven game and, and things like Starcraft or World of Warcraft. I've, I've played it, but not quite core. Okay. So what so, was the draw to game development for you? Well, I do love games, just not play it 24 okay. <laughs> seven. And I later realized I've always wanted to, uh, I would always imagined it would be really fun to develop games. But the reason I didn't chose for a game development study is mainly because I thought, well, I don't want to be one small part of a game development team. Uh-huh. I want to create the whole game. I don't want to create just the small feature within a huge studio. I see. So yeah, I, 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 I really wanted to create games, but I never imagined it would be, I, I should like create my own company and, yeah, and develop games myself. But, but here you are. Yeah, exactly. This, yeah, it's later I thought for, uh, this is really what I want. It's it's sort of the the Hollywood adage of oh, but I really want to direct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the uh, let's talk about VR here for a second. Uh, that is a a very new art form all the way around, or at least one that's only now starting to come into a little bit of prominence. And you guys are which uh, which formats are you guys uh, programming your game for? Uh, currently for the HTC Five and the Oculus Rift. Oh, okay, great. So those those are pretty much the main two. I don't think anybody's using that. Google Dream, whatever thing they've got. <laughs> Google, yeah, yeah. Oh, PlayStation VR is a big one as well. Oh, I see. Okay. Is there, how much uh, ad- adaption process is there from going from one platform to the next? Is that, how, how much rewriting of the game do you have to do? Uh, well, between Fife and the Oculus Rift, there's not that much. But there's, well, quite a few considerations you have to take if you want to uh, develop a game for a normal PC game or a VR. Uh-huh. In VR, there's a lot more freedom of uh, movement, sure. um, which creates their own problem on, on themselves. So players have a lot of more freedom to, uh, well, to break your game in, in a sense. So <laughs> to, to build in more 
safety measures so players won't get out of bounds or things like that. As well, there are some considerations in, well, for example, our game. The main part of our game, you play on a large ship, um, mainly on open sea. So you expect there will be high waves, etc. Uh-huh. Well, it isn't really recommendable to uh, let your ship bounce on the waves while you are in virtual reality. Okay. <laughs> you will get really seasick right. in, a, in a sense. So th- those are things you have to really think about, like, and VR has its things you, you, you wouldn't do in VR, which you easily could do in a normal PC game. Right. So technically it's not that difficult, but it's more like gameplay wise and what you have to consider. Right. Yeah. And uh, I can absolutely see something like seasickness being a problem with that. Uh, because yeah. a, a lot of the, a lot of the VR stuff that I've looked at already are, makes me ill because I get motion sick. Do you see VR stuff right now going in the, direction of realism and things that uh could possibly make you nauseous uh, roller coaster rides and what all or are the companies kind of playing that part down a little bit now so that it becomes a an enjoyable experience first and then they can push those boundaries later well in the very early beginning of vr uh there were a lot of tech demos and there were some roller coasters in there uh-huh. but i think at this point people or or studios are really trying to bring it down a bit and experiment with all the possibilities besides the, the, the just the visual uh, amazingness of virtual reality. Because yeah, uh, a roller coaster is great in virtual re- in virtual reality visually uh-huh. for your body and for your sickness. It's it's not that great. <laughs> so in the beginning, there were a lot of demos like that or flight simulators things like that uh-huh. but then then it became a more serious market i i think so businesses have to think more about is this really beneficial for for gaming in vr and it, it's definitely not uh-huh. so they brought it back a bit and maybe in the future with uh when we when we fix the, the issues which cause motion sickness uh they will bring it back again right and uh, is that so, yeah. Is that mostly caused by just the very slight amount of latency between the movement and the action on the screen? It shouldn't be. Okay. Uh, like the, the the hardware is pretty good. Uh, when uh, I I know when I first tried the uh, ACC five, I was amazed by the, the frame rate and the, the the precision of your your movement tracking. Uh, the main problem which causes motion sickness is um, a, a conflict between your sensors, uh, like your between your eyes and your I don't know how to call it the, the, the balance sensor in your ear, uh-huh. you know, which the problem uh, the same as uh, sickness when you're driving a car and reading in VR your eyes detect movement, but your body doesn't feel any G forces. Oh, I see. So it's it's ex- experiencing a conflict. Oh, that and makes that's sense. what causes uh, causes motion sickness. Oh, I see. And, well, yeah, that's that's the main problem. So yeah. So we need uh, haptic feedback body suits to cure that, then, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Like, okay, yeah. Yeah, you need in in some kind of way experience G forces on your body to match the sensory input from your eyes. Ah, interesting. Yeah. That makes sense. That's the main. That's the, the main problem in, in VR is motion sickness. Okay. All right. Interesting. So the uh, the visual look of your game, I really like. Who who came up with the the visuals? Um, the general atmosphere sphere is something we all agreed on. We didn't want a really gruesome pirate game where with a lot of blood and, and darkness and and scurvy on your ship and <laughs> things like that. You know, it's it's it's. I, I listened to the talk you had with the Sea of Thieves uh, guys, and I think we share a vision in that way that we want the more like find fantasy Disney visualization of, of pirates. Uh-huh. Like you are with your band of brothers on your ship. Your ship is your mobile base. It's something you have to maintain. It's, it's, yeah, it's keeping you floating on the water, but the outsiders are outsiders to you. So if you're not in, in my team, you are my enemy. Uh-huh. That's, that's a bit the, the thing. And, and the, the visuals, we want the visuals to show you that, that kind of feeling. So it's, it's not really gruesome and hostile, but if you're not on my team, you are my enemy. <laughs> I will let you sink. And that's a, a bit the, the, 
competition behind. Yeah, the uh, the the look of the characters and such is um, it's it's very uh, approachable and and a little bit uh, cartoony, uh, which I like. Uh, which I think is a cool thing. Uh, slightly Lego-ish, I, I thought, with the 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 hard angles and things like that, uh, which I, I thought was cool and is very approachable from a more uh, um, uh, not super gamer type, more casual gamer type, uh, like a lot of people yeah, sure. probably are. Yeah, because when you look at something like Sea of Thieves uh, or the other games that are out, you're just or you know Assassin's Creed or something like that, you're just like. Oh boy, that looks really complicated. You know, I don't even know how to move those guys around, but this one looks like something. You go, oh, I think I can figure that one out. So, <laughs> another benefit it brings is, uh, is indeed the, the edgy things, what we call in, in game of terms, is low poly. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So, there's a really low poly count, which uh, results in better performance in some way. So, it's it's less less hard for your graphics card to render all those objects because. Uh, these are pretty simple shapes to render. Uh-huh. So uh, it, it's look, it looks better for your eyes, and it's easier for your PC to, uh, to render. Well, that's cool. Where is the best place online for people to get the game? Where, which outlet do you prefer? I think Steam. Steam is our main uh, main platform where we uh, uh, where we sell our game. Okay. There are some other platforms, but uh, Steam is our main. Uh, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'll make sure I put that link in the show notes there. And uh, yeah. is there is there anything I forgot to ask you about that you want people to know about it? So one thing is um, we are currently working on 1.0. That's our major update, uh-huh. our major uh, new edit, which contains a lot of new features. Like uh, uh, we're putting in AI so you can fight with, uh, with non-playable characters. Oh, okay. And uh, if anyone is interested in the, the project or wants to communicate with us, um, we are uh, our main community platform is Discord. So, oh, okay. Maybe if you're interested, uh, people can join our Discord and uh, talk with us and give some input on the game they like. Fantastic! Very good, man. Uh, well, this is great. I'm glad we got a chance to talk. This is really cool. Yeah, great. Thanks. You bet. And uh, we'll send some people to go play your game, man. Yeah, that would be really cool. There it is, friends. That is my interview with Jasper Rauhorst from Craft Game Studio about Crooked Waters. If you want to go check out Crooked Waters, uh, you can do that over on Steam. Uh, and uh, there's a giant old link there, and that will be in the show notes. Uh, or if you if you know what Steam is, Steam is a store for video games on the web, uh, which I think is just Steam, Steam.com or SteamPowered.com, something like that. Uh, anyway, the link will be in the show notes. So if you just go into your podcast app right now and you click the cover art, uh, the notes will open up. There will be a link right in there to where you can get Crooked Waters on Steam. If you want to find out more about Craft Game Studio, go to craftgamestudio.com and you can check out that uh, as well as Indigenous, their other game, and all that kind of good stuff. Did you learn something new? Did you hear something you want to jump in the conversation on? Be sure that you come on over to Facebook. Tell us all about it. Facebook.com slash under the crossbones. Twitter slash under crossbones. Now, I'm gonna, I want to tell you about what we're going to do for the rest of December and into January. We're going to do something a little bit different here. But first, uh, of course, we are sponsored today by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, WKKC-DB, playing the best music of today's hits and yesterday's classics. And Pirate Radio Talk, playing the best pirate shows, including Under the Crossbones, 24-7 all commercial free. To listen, go to PirateRadioTheTreasureCoast.com or pick up the Pirate Radio WKKC-DB app from your favorite app store. That is the music station. Or for the talk station, go to PirateRadioTC.com or pick up the Pirate Radio Talk app in your favorite app store. Or if you got yourself an Android phone, you can say, OK, Google, and ask it to play it. Or, uh, oops, see, my phone just turned on when I did that. Or you can go to your Alexa device and say, hey, Alexa, uh, play uh, Pirate of the Treasure Coast for me, and it'll spit it right out at you uh, because it's listening to everything you say. All of it is brought to you by iTreasure Radio, the very best digital media from independently owned stations. Okay, so here's what's going on. Uh, we're going to have another show, a regular show next week, and then the week after that, uh, so next week is the 18th, ne- uh, the week after that is Christmas, December the 25th. Uh, which everybody's going to be kind of busy uh, and, and not a lot of people listen to podcasts that day. So what we're going to do on December the 25th is I'm going to uh, re-release uh, this year's most popular show, which I haven't figured out what that is yet. I got to go look at the stats and see what that is. So that'll be a surprise. We're going to reissue uh, the, that's your Christmas present. We're going to reissue the uh, the most popular show of 2018. We'll all find out what that is and that'll, that'll happen then on January 1st, which is the following Tuesday. These holidays are really blowing my schedule this year 
in a lot of different ways, but January 1st is the following Tuesday. Uh, there will be a new episode that day, and it will be an experimental episode. I'm not going to tell you what exactly yet I'm doing, but it's going to be a different sort of episode from what we've done so far. And I was deciding whether to put that on Christmas or New Year's Day, but I think I'm going to do it New Year's Day uh, so that we start the new year, start 2019 with something a little fresh and a little weird and a little bit different, uh, and we'll do that. And then the following Tuesday, January 8th, we will be back with a regular uh, interview episode that's going to be with Eric Anderson of Stormfront, uh, the the uh, the uh, Scandinavian pirate uh, group, uh, and that's going to be super fun. We're going to talk with Eric Anderson, who's one of the singers in that group, uh, and and then we'll be back into it. There, we're doing a lot of international stuff over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're Scandinavia, South Africa coming up, all sorts of cool things. Uh, that is our show for today. Thank you once again for tuning in. Uh, I always appreciate it. If you want to find out more about. Uh, uh, Crooked Waters and what the guys over there are doing you can go to craftgamestudio.com or just go over to Steam where you buy the video games and look up Crooked Waters the app uh, the link I'm sorry will be in your podcast app it'll be in the show notes show notes are at underthecrossbones.com slash 169 as well and the app for uh, the link for Crooked Waters will be there and you can check that out coming up next week super fun show this is a, we went far from home this week we're going close to my home next week because uh, we are going to talk about a Californian pirate. There's not a lot of them, not in history, right? Not at least that uh, in the, the time periods we've been talking about. But yeah, we're going to talk to Michael Melzer, who's the author of The Patriot Pirate about Hippolito Bouchard and the Battle of Monterey. So that's going to be very cool. It's stories we've never had on this show before. That's going to be great. Uh, and then, like I said, we're going to, on the 25th, on Christmas, we're going to hit the, the well, you'll get the most popular show of this year, whatever that is, after I look at the stats to find out. And then we will have an experimental show on January 1st. And then after that, on the 8th, we'll have Eric Anderson from Stormfront coming on. And the week after that, Liddell Joubert of Stable Seas, which is, uh, we're going to be there, an advisory board, sort of an advisory group for modern merchant marines and navies and things like that about modern piracy issues. So we're going to dig back into some modern stuff there. And I've got more coming up on the calendar that you are just, your bla- brain's going to explode. Or at least it'll be very happy. Your brain will be very happy. It'll have happy chemicals and it'll be all good. So again, get all the show notes for this episode under the crossbones.com slash 169. Thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.